All right. So um, thank you and um, uh, welcome from Brussels, Belgium, which is uh, sunny today. And uh, uh, thanks, Howard and Debbie, for the introduction. So this session is part of uh, the ins and outs of data modeling. And uh, by the end of this session, uh, you will hopefully know everything there is to know about uh, polyglot persistence and what we call uh, polyglot data modeling. So uh, while preparing for this, I uh, researched and found that uh, polyglot is a fancy word that means uh, multilingual. Um, and in the Oxford Dictionary, I uh, learned something. Uh, the two words, uh, according to Oxford Dictionary, uh, the two words are perfectly uh, interchangeable, except for one characteristic. Polyglot is both a noun and an adjective, wow. uh, whereas multilingual is only an adjective. So um, you will see that, uh, of course, in our context, polyglot uh, takes a, a special meaning. So uh, I'm Pascal Demaret, uh, and I've spent, it seems, my entire career in, um, in data. Uh, I created this startup uh, at age 55 uh, to create a new tool for data modeling, originally for uh, just MongoDB and then for all of NoSQL, and now also for storage formats, REST APIs, and a JSON in relational databases. So uh, to illustrate my passion about data, uh, even when I spend time uh, sailboat racing, uh, I can't help it but uh, play the role of the chief uh, data officer on the boat, uh, collecting uh, weather information and all kinds of measurements uh, about the boat to enhance the performance and tactics uh, while racing. So I also spend a lot of time uh, doing sports with my kids and watching sports as well. And I like, um, sports analogies in business. And one of my observations um, over the last 10 years has been that um, there's a new generation of young kids that are, is dominating some of the sports with a completely revolutionary approach. Um, I'll take the example of uh, Max Verstappen here, who uh, became a Formula One driver at age 17, which in uh, Holland and Belgium, where he was born, um, is only legally allowed at uh, 18 years old. Um, so he uh, was in Formula One before he could legally drive on open streets. François Gabard here, um, has held uh, records for single-handed racing around the world, both in the monohull and the multi-hull, and he's nicknamed uh, the Little Prince of the Ocean. And uh, Tadej uh, Pogacar here has won the Tour de France uh, twice already at age 22. And um, Marc Marquez here has completely revolutionized the way uh, motorcycle drivers approach um, uh, curves, and he was um, a world champion in his first year in MotoGP, which is the highest uh, discipline in, uh, in uh, motorcycle racing. And so I thought, um, I saw in previous uh, sessions you had that uh, people um, enjoy the interaction, and I thought, I would ask you what you think these four sports have in common uh, and get some uh, engagement uh, from the audience. So um, if you can um, use your smartphone and uh, scan the, uh, this uh, QR code uh, and start uh, voting, uh, we'll take a look at uh, what the results might be. Oh, okay. So one vote already. Anybody else? So we'll give it a couple of minutes, right? I need to get my QR code ready. Okay. Let me uh, bring it back. 
I'll, I'll put the um, I'll put the code in in the chat so people can. Okay. Copy and paste it. Yep. So the Menti code is in the chat for anyone who needs to get back to it. Let's Thanks. see what some of the results are. The link would have been handy too. Uh, You're right. right. Code, code's nice. Thank you very much. But uh, I'm because I can't get it to load on my on my smartphone for some reason. Oh, there it goes. There it goes. I spoke too soon. <laughs> it's a Canadian. Yeah, <laughs> no, I just yeah, the phone. I had to go find my phone. All right, so um, while votes are coming in, uh, yeah, let me just say that actually I'm, I'm surprised by the low rate of uh, mechanical because uh, all the sports are mechanical sports. Uh, yeah. um, there, um, you know, one of them did not have wheels uh, for sure, um, and you know. The main thing about the these four sports is that they all accumulate a ton of data. And of course, one of the reasons uh, these kids dominate the sport is probably uh, from the the fact that they're uh, from the game console generation, uh, and they're absolutely laser focused uh, about success. But um, all of their performance are are entirely data driven. Uh, much more than many of the uh, businesses we we work with. So you might wonder, um, and I'm trying to now go to the next slide. Um, you know, what does that have to do with uh, data modeling? And um, when I look at how uh, data processing has evolved um, over the last 15 years, Things used to uh, be really simple um, with three tier architectures. And then today it has changed uh, into an environment where we've got uh, NoSQL databases, REST APIs, event driven architectures, and there's all kinds of uh, links in the chain. Um, and uh, schemas are flying around uh, all over the place. And of course, in the last few years, uh, Silicon Valley startups um, have adopted these new ways of doing things. They have adopted, uh, of course, um, you know, cloud uh, uh, digital uh, digitalization of businesses, uh, you know, uh, migrations to new technologies, and these kids are doing things very differently than. Um, established businesses, let's put it this way, okay? And um, 10 years ago this month, Martin Fowler coined the expression uh, uh, polyglot persistence. Um, if you don't know who Martin Fowler is, he wrote many books and he's one of the authors of the Agile Manifesto. And um, the Agile Manifesto uh, for me has been both an incredible inspiration, um, and I often pretend that I've applied uh, the principles of the manifesto long before um, it existed or was published, um, but it's also been a source of frustration because it seems that many people have used the Agile um, uh, methods as an alibi to uh, produce mediocre uh, development work. And um, and so, you know, 10 years ago, um, uh, um, Martin Fowler talked about the fact that when it comes to databases, um, you shouldn't be just picking up just a relational database because everybody does it and you know what it, uh, what it, uh, how it works, but um, that you should uh, pick the right tool for the job. And he published this book that's also been ins an inspiration for me because, um, you know, when I look back at the uh, startup 
uh, Hacker Lake for uh, data modeling. It all you know, comes back to when I read this book and um, I understood how um, you know, the world would open to using these different kinds of technologies uh, to do uh, incredible things with uh, the modernization uh, of, of business uh, in this century. And so um, I recommend this book. It may be a little outdated um, in specific uh, maturity of the different database technologies, uh, but it still um, sets the scene for all of the possibilities that uh, the technology uh, brings to the table. So uh, when I was a kid, uh, there was a, always a debate uh, about audio systems. We didn't have the smartphones, we loved music. And the question was, you know, should you take the convenience of a boom box that had all of the elements integrated in uh, a single piece, or should you buy the best amplifier, the best turntable, the best speakers, et cetera? And um, when I talk to people in IT, there's always you know, someone who's gonna say, well, I just wanna have a single tool that does it all. And there's other people um, who say, no, you need to have best of breed. And, uh, you know, these two approaches are uh, typically difficult to reconcile. And, and in a way, they're both right. Um, it's all a matter of level of ambition and tolerance to uh, compromises. And when it comes to databases, um, it's exactly the same thing. So what uh, Martin Fowler said uh, in the book, uh, essentially, is that as enterprises uh, are becoming more complex and need to be more agile and need to respond faster and faster to customer needs, uh, the idea of finding a perfect data store that fits all situations is an illusion. And, um, and if you don't want to make compromises and you know, the, uh, your level of ambition is really high and you want what's best for solving the use, your use cases, you need to have the right tool for the job. So uh, obviously this you know, gives you tremendous power. It comes, uh, as always, with uh, drawbacks. Um, you need to multiply skill sets. You mult need to multiply, um, you know, the, the way you d do things. There's a learning curve for each uh, of those, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you need to uh, make a choice um, of, you know, and pick your poison, if I uh, may say. So one observation is that um, many people have been doing polyglot persistence without even knowing there was a name for it. And um, one of the use cases where you find this polyglot persistence is in data pipelines. And so if you imagine on the left-hand side here, you have uh, your operational uh, transactional databases and uh, because of the proliferation of tools, you now have uh, data feeds um, streamed from uh, the, these um, operational data stores to maybe a landing zone on uh, AWS uh, S3 buckets. Uh, and then this feeds a data lake with uh, multi-stage stage, uh, multi uh, curation and then it's streamed to uh, consumers of data um, in, into self-service analytics or uh, machine learning and um, artificial intelligence. So it may be that, uh, you know, it, it's probable that each of these steps is being handled through a different kind of technology. And you can see easily uh, that we now have um, an illustration of this polyglot persistence because you are storing data in multiple forms, in multiple technologies. Um, and this is something uh, that was foreseen uh, years ago already. Um, another 
illustration of polyglot persistence is maybe a little uh, more extreme, and it has to do with the fact that even for a single application, you might have multiple technologies that are involved, depend of the depending on the use case within uh, that application, uh, which would be a core um, application. And so you might still have relational databases for uh, your master data um, and using um, your know, key value stores for caching and uh, document from for product uh, catalog and uh, columnar uh, databases for log data um, and then doing fraud detection and recommendations with uh, property graph databases and uh, analytics uh, behind. And so you might have, uh, you know, for this core application, multi multiple uh, technologies that are at play. Um, and that's definitely an illustration of polyglot persistence. So uh, this is a slide still out of um, Martin Fowler's um, publications that tries to help decide whether polyglot persistence is uh, is a good option for you. And uh, you know the the criteria might be that uh, the the development must be strategic. In other words, not just a maintenance uh, project or utility project uh, within your ecosystem, but something more core and strategic. And that at the same time, there is a requirement for <clears throat> rapid time to market and or the, that it's data intensive. Um, I think that today when we talk about uh, core applications, um, you know, all of these criteria are quickly, um, uh, are quickly in the, the picture as well. And so polyglot persistence should be something uh, to be considered. And when it comes to those uh, different technologies, uh, there's again two approaches. One which is to really go for the best of breed approach and take within each segment or within each use case, um, the best or uh, uh, the best fit for the use case, or to search for some sort of Swiss army knife that is called a multi-model database that will let you handle all of these different things. So um, the only word of caution that I would have um, about the multi-model approach is that um, it is often used as a marketing message by uh, database vendors uh, to say, well, me too, I can do this. Um, but are we back to the boombox um, analogy uh, of trying to make it fit the use case um, rather than having um, a true best of breed uh, native solution for things? So um, as a second um, interaction, I was going to ask if um, the audience would uh, go to the second vote and uh, see um, that you're engaged in uh, in polyglot persistence um, today um, as we as we speak so um, we have some votes already and it seems like sorry pascal could i ask you a question whilst they're voting um... oh sure uh, I just wanted to confirm, because in some cases you use technology, and I, and I like that final slide where you said multi-model, because, because it's, is it more about the persistence structure or is it about technology? Which which one, I mean, uh, I, I saw multi-model, and, and let's take some examples, Oracle can support, or maybe markets that it can support all of those different areas. SQL servers doing the same thing. So is your is your polyglot persistence more about the ability to support multiple types of data in the structure, or is it technology? Are you are you focusing on both of them, or just the? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. I'm actually 
focusing on both of them because I think there are nuances. Um, our tool supports them all, so we're completely technology agnostic. Um, but I think there's a difference between, and I'll take a, uh, a, an example, uh, storing JSON in a blob in Oracle or in a Varkar 4000 in SQL Server and equivalent in the, all the relational databases may feel like it's the same thing as using MongoDB, but it isn't um, because um, you storing JSON in a relational database is like uh, using a key value store where you know there's a key to access and then the value is a JSON payload. Whereas um, a technology like MongoDB or Couchbase or DocumentDB um, will have uh, the ability to index on deeply nested objects within the JSON and an API and a programming language or a query language, let's say, that lets you uh, access the data in a more native way. And so, um, uh, yeah, when I, when I talked about multi-model and uh, Swiss Army knives, I was thinking about relational databases catching up to NoSQL. Uh, seeing how popular they're becoming and saying, well, with marketing, we're going to try to uh, make it so people remain with us and don't venture um, outside of uh, the ecosystem. Does that answer your question? Uh, in, in a way, it does. I, I see where you're going, but uh, for example, I, and I know SQL Server, it has different structures. So for example, its graph database is not in the relational database. Its document file stream is not in the relational database. So you almost got different tables, uh, structures within that within that one technology, but it's supporting uh, different different types of structure. But I, I get what you're saying, and and I know that I used uh, XML, but I, we you are able to get. SQL to index the XML documents so that you can get to the right level. And it's not just that var char max or the or the var binary max. Um, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah. So uh, when you try, you know, uh, for example, Neo4j for a graph database or uh, Cassandra uh, for column oriented uh, or Mongo for a document store, it will be you know, quite a different experience than the flavors of these functionalities in the uh, in a multi-model. Uh, uh, and even some of the NoSQL vendors um, have said that they're multi-model, but when you actually try their product um, and you install or, or you, you launched an instance, uh, in the cloud, the, if the first question they ask you is, would you like the document API or the columnar API or the graph API? And once you've made that choice, you cannot go back and apply multiple uh, uh, multiple APIs, then I think they're not truly multi-model. They support multiple models, but um, I, you know, in my mind, there's only one that is truly multi-model, and I'm still not uh, advertising them. But I recognize that Mark Logic is probably the only one that is truly multi-model out of all of them. That's my personal observation. All right. Okay. Okay. So uh, we've seen the result, and uh, so um, you know, there's uh, quite a few people who. Um, uh, are doing polyglot persistence or, or uh, are in the middle, um, but the average is still um, you know, uh, below the, the middle. Um, so another sport analogy uh, that I like is uh, Mike Tyson's quote about the fact that everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. And you know, with data modeling, um, we are uh, 
we're planners. We believe in the fact that we need to think first before uh, development takes place, before coding takes place. Um, but that point of view has been um, challenged, I think, uh, in the last uh, 10 years by agile developers and maybe by um, impatient managers who always want quick results, want things to be done quick and dirty without spending too much time or money, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we have a, a sort of a conflict that needs to be resolved uh, on that point. Um, because in the Agile Manifesto, um, which I talked about earlier, there's clearly you know, the, the second um, uh, the second statement in the manifesto is that we prefer or we value working software over comprehensive documentation, meaning that good documentation is useful to help people understand how the software is built. Um, but the point is to develop and create software, not to create documentation. And there's been sometimes uh, We've seen at some uh, large companies uh, that people say, well, you know, before we can do anything, we've got to map the entire enterprise uh, data model, and it's going to take a long time to uh, get accomplished. And uh, but really, we shouldn't be moving forward until that's done. And that's given uh, data modeling, uh, you know. A reputation, right or wrong, that it's in the way of getting things done. And uh, in this new world where uh, things are being done differently, faster, with new tools, um, there's a question about whether the uh, well-known three-step process of data modeling, going from conceptual, then logical, then physical, whether that's still um, compatible with agile development uh, today. And, uh, you know, another uh, a phrase in the agile manifesto is that we should be responding to change over following a plan. In, or, in other words, we want to be able to uh, deliver this working software and continue to address the changing needs um, of the stakeholders as the project is taking place. When it comes to data modeling, there is a big challenge. And the challenge is the fact that data modeling needs to be done in a completely different manner than with relational. Uh, with relational, we've been used to uh, the rules of normalizations that have taught us to uh, minimize um, duplication and build something that is that is application agnostic and will stand the test of uh, you know the, the future needs of an application and the ways it's going to be queried uh, over time and we want to build a beautiful generic model that will uh, stand the test of time with no SQL databases, it's a completely different approach and it's difficult for people who have been uh, doing relational for so many years, if not decades, to adapt to the fact that not only we should favor uh, denormalization, but we should really start with denormalization. And the way to do this is to say, that for every application screen that generates a query or a report that generates a query, we need to understand that query pattern and all of the attributes that are going to be required uh, to be able to uh, satisfy, you know, bring the results back to the screen or to the report. And it's that query that will define the data model and therefore how data is going to be stored. In other words, rather than doing joins on read like we do with relational databases, what we really want to push for is that the data is joined on write before, uh, when it's stored. And that way, whenever you need the data, you've got everything 
um, together that belongs together and you don't have to do expensive joins. So all of the, uh, the principles of data modeling uh, for NoSQL go around this concept of studying your access patterns and queries, which will drive the way you store data uh, and how the data is going to be joined um, at storage time uh, when you write. And so when we look at this uh, challenge that uh, uh, developers are putting uh, to data modeling, they're saying, look, we understand how to manipulate uh, data objects. We know how to, to do data modeling. We don't need data modelers for that. Um, and, you know, I personally don't believe in that, but I've witnessed this a lot uh, in organizations. And they do this with a good intention, which is to say, it's not the data model that matters, it's the schema that matters. So in other words, what is consumable by the machines and the systems is what really matters and not the, uh, the, the data model. And um, you know, the, the problem is it really forgets the fact that data modelers are the ones that have this incredible talent to understand the business and translate it into a picture that um, most stakeholders understand, um, you know, particularly if they don't like to look at code. Um, and But the developers are right in saying that it's the, the consumable contract between the, the producer and consumer of data that really matters for systems uh, to work. So the schemas, they're not just limited to relational databases. Uh, they're found more and more in data exchanges. Um, and so that's APIs, remote procedure calls, uh, streaming uh, systems like Kafka, et cetera, et cetera. You find schemas everywhere. And, um, with our application, we support a whole bunch of uh, technologies for um, databases and data exchanges. So at the top, you see lot, you know, a whole bunch of families of NoSQL databases. We also support JSON in RDBMS and big data analytics, but we also support uh, REST APIs, uh, Avro and Kafka, uh, parquet, uh, et cetera, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And what we found with our customers when they uh, use these different technologies is they, they kept asking, okay, so I've got this data model from MongoDB. How can I save it as an Avro uh, schema for Kafka? Or how can I generate a REST API automatically for that. Um, and rather than uh, answering specifically that need, we elevated the debate and thought, let's abstract all this um, to a higher level and uh, let's gather all of the needs of our customers. So uh, obviously data is transmitted and stored in a variety of formats and technologies. Um, these artifacts, you know, people don't want to have to define them over and over again. Um, we, and, and in particular, they keep evolving all the time because we've got agile sprints every two weeks, let's say, and uh, there's constant evolution of the needs of customers, and therefore we need to add columns here, uh, structures over there, et cetera. And these uh, schemas that are uh, scattered all over the place uh, belong to different stakeholders within the organization, or they have uh, different life cycles. How can we make sense of all of this? And uh, um, so we looked at different alternatives and thought, okay, well, let's not reinvent the wheel if there's something that will do the work. You know, is there a way that we could have a common physical schema for all that would work for all of these different technologies? And we looked at 
possible alternatives. You know, should we take uh, DDL, uh, you know, and Z language uh, to define all these things? And we found that there were a number of uh, shortcomings that we couldn't um, uh, overcome, uh, you know, without a lot of work or uh, diverging, you know, greatly from the standard. Um, so RDBMS DDLs, Snowflake uh, came up with, you know, some, um, uh, you know, great um, synonyms for a whole bunch of uh, data types to accommodate uh, the different things. They introduced complex data types that maybe uh, maybe didn't exist at the time with RDBMS, but we kept running into uh, into shortcomings. Um, Hive uh, was a very promising one, but um, it had its own shortcomings, um, missing a whole bunch of data types. Glue data catalog is based on Hive. So we switched to uh, you know different kinds um, of uh, schemas, and JSON schema looked uh, very promising because it really um, allowed for all of the different um, data uh, for all the different uh, complex hierarchical structures, but it was poor in terms of data types. Um, and even though it could be expanded, uh, extended, um, there's the issue of foreign key relationships and XSD had the same thing and Avro in the end um, also. So we came to the conclusion that we needed to invent something uh, new and different, um, which we called a polyglot data modeling. And the definition that came out of, the, uh, of all the, uh, the customer interactions was that it needed to be technology agnostic, work for databases and data exchanges, and accommodate all of the different data types that you can find in these different technologies. The problem being that you don't want to be uh, to make compromises based on, uh, on based on the lowest common denominator, um, and in particular. Complex data types are used to do denormalization. And so um, this data normalization is what's required to do the query driven design that I talked about um, earlier uh, that is absolutely necessary for NoSQL databases plus other some other advanced things. So people said, oh, it needs to be technology agnostic. So that means you're building a logical data model. And I said, well, no, that's the problem. You know, there's, you know, the, there's debates about exactly what is or what should be a logical model. But uh, there's a bunch of things on which uh, most people agree. Uh, and it is indeed that it's technology agnostic, uh, but mostly it, it's supposed to be fully normalized. Um, denormalization of views is something that is done more on the physical side. And it's not, denormalization is not treated as a first class citizen in uh, logical models. So um, we found very uh, constrained by the terminology of logical models and to uh, differentiate ourselves, we said, okay, so it's not a, even though it's technology agnostic, it is not a logical model or it's a logical model on steroids because we want to address the shortcomings of um, a logical uh, data model uh, in its pure uh, definition of the term. So in the end, what we call data uh, polyglot data modeling is a, a common physical schema that is used for data modeling of uh, polyglot persistence and data pipelines. And so it enables us to define a master uh, version that is technology agnostic and can be instantiated in any of these target technologies, as we call them, whether they're relational, document, columnar, 
graph uh, key value store multimodel. And it can be used to convert, let's say, a MongoDB model into a Cassandra model, uh, Cassandra being here, uh, or etc. cetera. So uh, this is something, so uh, the polyglot data model not only allows you to have a master, which if it evolves, lets you evolve uh, very easily uh, the data model of the underlying technology, but it also lets you uh, do conversions. And we do this for, you know, with a um, graphical uh, entity relationship diagram uh, for most technologies. For graph technologies, we can make it look um, even different. But the point is that you should start with the denormalization, with the um, the query driven approach on the um, um, on the polyglot side, which will naturally flow to the NoSQL uh, databases that handle the complex data types, and it's only in the case where uh, you need that polyglot model to be instantiated into a relational model that um, it's going to get normalized on the fly because it's much easier to normalize on the fly a denormalized model than the opposite. And then um, I'm you know, running out of time. Um, I just wanna uh, talk about the vision for um, Hackerlate uh, in, um, in a way where this design of uh, the data model, um, as I said, should not be an end in itself. What matters is on the technical side that schemas are being consumed and exchanged in contracts between producers and consumers. And we achieve this through a GitOps uh, type of uh, integration. Uh, so CICD pipelines uh, can leverage um, the data models to integrate um, with the uh, with the development pipelines and uh, DevOps uh, approach of companies, and here on the left hand side, to make sure that these structures that have evolved on the technical side uh, are also published to the community of data users, so they can understand how this technology, um, uh, how the schemas have evolved so they can do self-service um, analytics um, and uh, consume the data that is available in the technology. In the end, and this is my last slide, I think Dilbert says it best. Um, you shouldn't be, uh, or managers shouldn't be picking the technology uh, for any other reason than the fact that it needs to fit the use case and you should be using the best tool for the job. And that concludes um, my talk for today. I hope you enjoyed it and I'm uh, happy to stay on for questions and uh, answers. Pascal, thank you, thank you very much. Um, so I'm, I'm sure there there must be quite a few questions out there. Um, anyone like to ask some questions? I know I have a few, but would love to hear what what everyone has to say. There's even those guys who are clapping. That would be good to to hear what you're excited about. Any anyone have a comment? Okay. You know, Max, it was quite interesting a concept of uh, how uh, the data could be um, modeled and support um, uh, different kind of uh, data storage. So, so I have one question. Is that it is so that uh, it's um, possible to use this as a translation between <clears throat> different databases? So if you have data in one storage form, you can actually use this as a translation and, and move the data into a new storage form. So, um, interesting question. I 
always make a difference between data and data structure. So exchanging data between systems, um, that's done either you know, uh, through ETLs or through streaming. Um, and there's plenty of tools out there, uh, whether incumbent tools that have been around for a long time or services by the cloud companies uh, that ensure the uh, the schlepping <laughs> and the the move, movement of data or uh, its transformation. Um, and and then there's data structures. What matters, of course, is that you have a good grasp on source and destination and a good mapping of all of that. Uh, we deal only with the data structure, letting you know the the powerful and uh, known tools to do the transform, you know the actual moving of the data itself. So transforming data structures, we know very well. Um, but transforming data, that becomes easy once you've done your mapping between source and destination. Does that answer your question? Yes. Can we have Benzi, Benzi, Mishlangu? Hey, thank you, uh, Pascal. Thanks, Howard, and everyone. I think that was quite insightful. Uh, even though um, my mind is li a little bit puzzled from a practicality point of view, because uh, uh, if I'm just looking at, you know, metadata management uh, as an as an organization, you will already have, you know, a metadata probably, you know, uh, accompanied by a catalog already. And from a design point of view, then you will have uh, different modeling tools that you, you know, you currently um, have. And the very same thing with, you know, repository um uh, things are you you usually find them you know in place even though they will not be aggregated in you know in a single place so i'm just trying to put my mind um uh, at uh, have to late to say you know how how then does it work with what is practically there within uh, within the organization with the tool sets that are already there and that are servicing you know different aspect uh, of of business now of you know uh, different stakeholders uh, within you know the data management yeah so uh, that's a very good question uh, so uh, data catalogs are wonderful for uh, the business facing community and um, but they're not necessarily ideal for entity relationship diagram pictures and design, in particular when it comes to um, the, the developers who need to convert that into schemas that can be manip manipulated by code uh, when the application deals with the data. So I think that all these tools have their forte uh, in places, uh, but again, you'd, it's, it would be hard to use, uh, let's say, Calibra to do schema design uh, uh, for uh, developers. Um, the data cataloging, and you know, of course, you need dictionaries to uh, to promote uh, consistency and quality. And uh, you know the data modeling tools need to um, to refer to uh, libraries of objects that have been defined uh, in a harmonious manner uh, within the catalogs and the dictionaries. But a, a catalog and a dictionary is not a design tool for schemas. Um, and so I think there's complementary complementarity of um, all of these tools um, to achieve the you know the the agility um, the quick evolution uh, that that ha that happens in organizations does that make sense uh thank you i think that what you said just makes sense um i understand what you are saying so the, there's always a, a question there then 
of who's the master, right? And uh, and when integrating uh, a, 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 a design tool like an entity relationship diagram data modeling tool with a data dictionary, I think that there needs to be tight in integration. So there is no conflict of who's the master of what. Um, otherwise, you run into conflicts and you know politics almost between the owners of these different tools. So this needs to be looked at carefully, I think. Thanks, Benzi. Thank and, and, uh, Pascal, then we have another question from Philip, uh, Philip Duplessis. Hi, so very nice to meet you. Um, so you have all of these schemas, someone read, someone write, uh, sitting across all of pretty much your data landscape and your application landscape. How do you solve for lineage between the schemas? Because that is a that is quite a question that comes up quite often. So yeah. how would you solve for the lineage there beyond? So actually, I had a line in one of the slides. I didn't read it, and yeah. I said, "Be careful about uh, data lineage." Uh, and indeed, it, uh, it can be a challenge, and that's a challenge that needs to be addressed through uh, naming conventions and um, and careful uh planning of uh how to uh, handle these things inside a data catalog i think personally uh that it goes a little beyond the scope of pure data modeling although many data modeling tools um, now uh, include lineage capabilities uh, but i think lineage is um, uh, a discipline in itself that requires the proper tooling and that the data modeling tools need to feed the proper information uh, to the uh, data lineage tools. Um, I know in our case, we do a, a, a limited uh, level of things which we call lineage capture, which is uh, simple um, in the sense that when you do denormalization, we track all of the steps of these denormalizations so uh, they can be fed to an, ent uh, an ETL tool or lineage tool. And uh, so we would still be able to trace the transformations between source and destination. Uh, but I think that lineage in itself is too important uh, to be delegated to a tool that for which it's not the specialty. Um, so, uh, but it, it, a very good point and very, uh, very big challenge indeed when dealing with polyglot persistence. Thank you so much. So maybe just to ask another question there, uh, Pascal, because I don't know if you've seen Irina Stenkamp's new book on data lineage. And what I liked what she did was she differentiated between vertical data lineage and horizontal data lineage. Hmm. And the vertical data lineage was the lineage uh, along the data model details. So that would be your conceptual, logical and physical. And I believe if I'm not wrong, your model that you have in terms of the polyglot model and then the transformation, that would have those that lineage, the vertical we're talking about. Yeah, so uh, in the case of our product, it does, um, and it does for the simple reason that uh, if you make a change in the polyglot model, you want to make sure that in each of the physical models for the different target technologies, people have the choice of including um, these evolutions. Um, now, we also allow some deviations because uh, you know, maybe there's something particular about the physical instance that might be different. Uh, so we, we do a, a accommodate that. Um, but where it differs maybe is in the sense that this three-step process of conceptual, uh, logical, physical 
is a bit turned on its head when it comes to NoSQL, because instead of taking it top down, as I call it, uh, conceptual, high level first, then logical, then physical, that doesn't actually work so well with NoSQL, uh, which is more of a bottom up approach, which is, you know, what is the query? What are all the, 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 the columns in the select that I'm going to have in my query uh, so that I can define what it is that I need to, to store? Um, and so the, the conceptual uh, model may help in making sure that we don't forget any uh, attributes in the query, but it's not a, uh, such a top-down uh, approach as, uh, as, in, uh, as you would do in relational. So need to be uh, careful about that. But um, I, you know, I'll look up the, the book and, uh, and, and see what I can learn from it. Uh, I, I was not aware. Yeah, I think that I think you know whichever way it happens, even if it's bottom up, as, as long as you've got the linkages to a point that the business can relate to a certain model to understand, without understanding the technology, they can understand what that attribute is all about or what the concept right. is. Yeah, um, that seems like you you have that mapping. Um, yes, we do. But the context and meaning. Uh, yes. So, for example, we. Uh, that context and meaning is often going to be maintained by data citizens in, for example, a Calibra or an Alation or some uh, some other um, meta ma data management suite. And what is important is to be able to synchronize that with uh, the data modeling tools so there is no conflict in this definition of the context and meaning. And so it can be uh, available across the board and that the developers um, you know, see the meaning that is uh, developed by the subject matter expert uh, on the business side. Right, so I, I think that the synchronization of all of this meta data information is important for the success of a project. That uh, there is ubiquitous language, and that there is a common um, understanding of the meaning. Right. Okay. Um, I, I'd just like to go to Abdul first, and then we'll go back to Philip. Philip, I see your hand still up. I'm not sure we've got another one, but Abdul. Can what, you have a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you for the interesting session. Uh, with the, uh, uh, we have the data modeling for relational databases for years now, rather <laughs> decades. Uh, do we have any recommended tools for data modeling in NoSQL? Because there are different ways in modeling in NoSQL as well. For example, single table design, multiple table design, and then the hierarchical design. So do you uh, have any recommended tool? And also we talked about the polyglot modeling that we can potentially transform. We start from the NoSQL JSON and then we transform into the other uh, data models, RDBMS models, do we have tools to uh, generate those models based out of the uh, NoSQL design that we have done? Well, um, shameless plug, <laughs> the, our, our tool uh, can do all of that, right? Uh, so for DynamoDB, for example, we will handle both the single table design and the multi-table design. We will do polyglot data modeling is a phrase that we coined, um, et cetera. So uh, shameless plug, uh, look up hackolate.com and, uh, and uh, download our product and try it for yourself. Thank you. Okay, are there, are there any other questions? Peter, uh, Philip, I saw your hand went down. I'm assuming that you, your, your question was answered. Any... No, just on my hand got a bit tight. Oh, okay. okay, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, my apologies, I joined extremely late, so I got some of the slides and I missed some of the slides. Um, did you perhaps cover, so you're saying within the NoSQL construct that you would almost take it from a bottoms-up approach, and I get that. 
would you take it all the way to a conceptual model? Uh, so I, I think one of the problems that you have is if you have, let's say, 3000 JSON structures somewhere in your system, and now to go and put a data model down, people start getting very overawed by taking in all of these chunks, and you almost want to derive some concepts out of there that is almost like your executive summary of your model. Do you have the ability to take it from a bottoms up approach to a conceptual model or not really? Um, so uh, the short answer, we don't have it yet. Um, but what we're thinking is when you talk about 3000 JSON documents, um, I think that there is an approach with uh, graph databases that let you uh conceptualize all of that provided of course that you can find some commonality in the uh, naming of uh, fields right because you're if you have a zip code here and postal code there uh for an address um you know and you either you have some artificial intelligence that will know that you know these are somewhat equivalent uh, or it's going to have to be done manually. But when it comes to the number you're talking about, 3,000 JSON documents, I think that a graph database will give you a conceptual view of that. And it's something we're thinking about uh, putting in our tool, uh, but we don't have it yet. It, I, I think it takes some thinking and hard work uh, to accomplish. Gotcha. Thank you so much. And, and Pascal, just to sort of comment on that, because I think that's sort of what the new data mesh discussions are all about, is that ability to map to some form of knowledge graph where mm -hmm. they, they can then bring all these documents together and, and generate the active metadata as they refer to. Um, uh, Abdul, I see your hands up. Would you? Is there another question from you, sir? Uh, no, I think uh, I was in the previous one. I'll do that. Okay, thank you very much. Any any other questions? Max, it looks like you've got a question. Yes, I have another question. So, um, uh, how is uh, your thinking around what you've been doing around data models uh, um, versus um, ontology? So, for example, uh, there is an ontology named Fibre for financial, uh, describing a financial data model, but it uh, is not, yeah, the data model comes as a result of, uh, of that I had uh, done the ontology modeling right. of the information. So um, so uh, we, it's the last um, family of NoSQL that we don't support yet, but it's definitely very high on the radar screen, and it is the support for a semantic knowledge graph. Uh, and uh, you know, GraphDB, uh, OntoText, uh, all of those uh, graph uh, knowledge graph databases, linked data. Uh, JSON LD um, and the capability uh, that we need to develop, which is currently in design phase, but um, not yet with an ETA, um, is to speak um, RDFS, OWL, Shackle, um, because it's definitely, uh, you know, the, the alphabet soup is making it uh, I think hard for the common uh, person to adopt this technology, which I think is full of so much power and promises. Um, but you're you're right. In a way, it's it is schemaless. So if it exists, if the database exists, you could infer the the, the data model from the data. Um, but if you need to start it from scratch, you need to think through what you want to store and how you want to store it. And I think that that's where a data modeling tool uh, would help 
shorten the learning curve and accomplish um, results much quicker. Thank you. OK, um, any any other questions? So, so I see so Philip saying it, it depends uh, on if relationships are well defined or uh, as to how good your uh, model will show up. So one remark uh, regarding that. Uh, so we call um, the traditional databases relational databases. And I think personally that it's a misnomer because uh, in my mind, uh, these, uh, this technology, uh, all of that it does, uh, uh, in addition to everything that it does, um, is that it enforces foreign key relationships. But you need to know ahead of time how the data relates to each other. The beauty of some of the uh, graph databases is that they let you discover relationships you didn't know exist. One of the big selling points of uh, Neo4j is how they contributed to the Panama Papers and the uh, uh, and uh, you know these um, uh, newspaper uh, investigations on uh, tax evasion where they discovered relationships that they didn't know existed between entities and people and directors of companies and people laundering money and all of that. And that's, I think, uh, one of the beauties of these new technologies and new databases and where they are more relational than the so-called relational databases. Um, so relational databases, you need to have imagined how the data will relate to each other. And okay, that can make it relational, but um, the graph databases will, reve will reveal relationships you didn't know existed. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I just have a, a last question, Pascal, and that's um, when you did that diagram, and, and I also know from Martin Fowler that in his domain-driven development, he also talks a lot about the canonical model, um, almost in terms of, of there's, there's a transformation on your schema when you're exchanging data that it gets transformed to the canonical model. And I think you mentioned that as that's something that you allow other tools to handle. But your central model, the polyglot model, that is then translated to language slash technology dependent elements, does that contribute or can it contribute to the development of a canonical model which is standardized across all structures? So in theory, yes. Um, I, my personal experience with canonical models is um, that I have found them to be often um, too difficult to change from a political point of view in the organization, <laughs> where people said, oh yeah, but you can't change this. You know, the implications are, are too big. And so, I, I don't personally have uh, an inclination to promote canonical models uh, when it, if it becomes um, counterproductive. But technically, yes, we that's what we do. <laughs> you know, the, the polyglot model can be elevated to a status of canonical model. Um, but it's just in an agile development world, um, it, it tends to um, to make people frustrated about getting things done. But isn't that your like structure around your microservices and all of that is 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 based on that common model so that people can exchange data? Yeah, with pragmatism. Sure. You know, and, <laughs> 
Yeah, it's very similar to an enterprise data model. And trying to get consistency, you, you have the same political challenges. Right. So what, what we find with our customers is that, and I'm not saying that I'm encouraging this, but we're to a point in uh, a developer-centric world where some companies are now doing data governance after the fact. So it used to be that you would do the data modeling upfront before the project started. And of course it evolved a little bit, but there's places today where there has not been any data modeling. Applications are in production. Uh, kids are, uh, evolving the application on a daily basis in an agile mode, doing you know hundreds, if not thousands, of commits in a day, and then companies say, "Yeah, but I've got to satisfy GDPR, or PII, and all of these things. So how do I do that?" And they so they do it by doing daily, uh, overnight, often reverse engineering of databases in production to find out what's in the database and doing their data governance after the fact. So, you know, it may sound scary. No, no, <laughs> I, 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 no, but no, it's I, a reality. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've we've almost got to a situation where the Data modeling slash reverse engineering has become a production tool. Yes, yeah. and many of our customers have done that. They uh, they pushed us to develop our command line interface that so they can script uh, it and run it on a schedule every night. Compare with a baseline, bring a report of what the, are the new fields that appeared overnight. Uh, study, you know, is this. GDPR uh, compliant, or is there a confidentiality issue, et cetera, et cetera? And it's done after the fact. Yeah. Okay, I've got another question from Philip. Philip, did you see you got this? It's more a statement than a question. So I do think a canonical model does have its place in the sun. So specifically when it comes to larger enterprises, we for example, you need to measure across the enterprise, uh, across multiple systems, right? And uh, let's say, for example, you've got a couple of systems that express a, an account in a certain way, and other systems express it in a different way. Some are NoSQL, some are structured, some are even, heavens forbid, some COBOL, and so on and so forth. And now you need to bring all of this data together from an analytical perspective. That is kind of where the canonical model would shine, right? Now, I'm sure within the NoSQL world, you could solve some of it, but I take with a pinch of salt that you couldn't get away with a canonical model. You, know, you, you kind of have this one thing in your arsenal, and that is, you need to provide an integrated account object that's that stores all of the data from all of these underlying systems. Now, fair enough, you could get away with a without a canonical model on each system. You could go, you could put a graph together, you could do many, many things, right? But on bringing all of these systems data together and express it at, in a common way, how would you be able to do that without a canonical model? Philip, it's a good point. It's it's not really on this meeting, and and I, but basically that's what the data mesh is talking about, and it is talking about uh, semantic uh, harmonization, uh, and they talk about a, an automated version versus a manual version. Uh, people are saying that the manual version is no longer working. Um, and they have, they do claim to be able to achieve uh, an automated harmonization in what you're referring to. Uh, so check out the data mesh. I can also send you some documentation on that. Um, and and so the, the, this harmonization between and preventing your analytics from reading different data sets, assuming they're the same, but but coming up with the wrong answer, it causes lots of challenges. But sure. it is. It is it is a it is a challenge that we face. Um, 
Okay, any any other questions, any other comments from Pascal? Oh, Pascal, sorry. Pascal, would you like to close with anything? Any any last comments? Um, no, I, I think that uh, the remark on canonical model is actually, um, I, I agree with it. I just think that uh, in an agile world, it may be that you're doing it after the fact rather than upfront because uh, yeah. managers will demand uh, that things move faster and that you need to deliver value uh, quicker. Um, yeah. And so we're not allowed the time to think about all of the implications of a complex organization uh, to build the data, the canonical model up front. That's my main observation of the world that has changed. Yeah, I think that that's the, the same argument in the data mesh. There's two, there's two schools of thought. The one is that they need to model the harmonization. The other one is that they believe that uh, they can use AI and active metadata to build that integrated harmonized model. So um, lots of people, I think it was even Scott Taylor that said he didn't see the, that automated unification, but it's, it will be interesting to see where they come out on this one. All right, but uh, so thanks for having me. Thanks for the opportunity Thank to talk to your community. It's been a pleasure for me. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. We'll we'll certainly we'll publish the recording and we'll publish a write up um, as soon as possible. Perfect. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank thanks. you. Thanks, Davey. Bye. Thank you.